All right, everybody, here we go. Um, sorry I can't be with you today. Uh, hopefully the internet is working again soon, and we're back in school after yesterday's festivities. So where we are, up to this point, the French Revolution hasn't been overly violent. But people are beginning to organize themselves into political parties. The largest and most powerful, powerful political party were known as the Jacobins. And the Jacobins were made up of mainly the lower class and poor people. And they elect a subsect of their group known as the Girondists to represent them in the assembly. So the Girondists go in, they are the representatives of the poor. And they assume leadership in the assembly in France is struggling. They have this internal conflict over the battle with the church. They've got this external war going on against Austria, and they're financially broke. And the war with Austria goes from bad to worse. And the war against external enemies, changes the revolution. It makes it more radical and more violent. It's what's known as the Second Revolution. And with the war going badly, the city council of Paris switches from one that was selected kind of by social class that the people chose when they marched out to the um, tennis courts. And now every neighborhood, every ward of Paris gets to send people to the new government. And these were people that were inexperienced at running a government. They may have been day laborers, they may even have been artisans, but they didn't know how to run a country, they didn't know how to solve political crises. And so they break in to the royal palace. The king and queen have to run to the assembly building and ask the Girondists to spare their lives. And they live under house arrest. And this is where things really begin to go bad. By the first week of September of 1792 is where we are going to get the downfall of the monarchy. Things are about to go really bad. And this individual here is known as a sans culot. And they're known for this by their jacket and the pants they wore, these kind of heavy pants that came down just below the knee, kind of like clam diggers, and they represented the working class, the poorest of the poor. They had on these like brownish, like dirty brown, earth burnt on brown pants. And first week of September 1792 is known as the September Massacre. French citizens are going to kill over 1,200 people in the city jails. These people in the jails were all thought to be anti-revolutionaries. They were working against the revolution. Nobody stopped to ask themselves, why are these people in jail? So the people that broke in killed people who were jailed by the royals, who were jailed by the nobles, so they kill 1,200 of basically their own people. And this revolution is led by the guys with the pants that I just showed you, known as the sans culot. These were working class wage laborers. They worked every day for a sum of money. These were the people that were below the um, peasants almost, below the low class. They had been ignored by all other governments, by the royal government, by the initial revolution, by the government of the middle class, and what they simply wanted was relief from the food shortages. They just wanted to be able to feed their families in this uncontrollable inflation. Right? We want to be able to feed our families, we're working hard, we want to be able to afford it, but we're getting nothing. And worse than anything, is they hated social class distinction. Don't look down on us because we're workers. All right? You really need us. 
And what they wanted was a government that would enforce universal male suffrage. Every male in here should begin to vote. Or be able to, to vote. From Tagus and Benin to in first period to Jackson and Big Joe in third period, we want to be able to vote. And they forced the National Assembly to write another new constitution. And they do so. And they come up with another new government, the third new government, the National Constituent Assembly becomes the National Assembly. Now they are the, the um, convention. And the convention um, declares France to be a democratic republic. The sans culottes were so numerous and so powerful. Remember what Aristotle said. If you want to control the government, control the middle class. Well, the sans culottes are huge. They're the biggest part of the French population. And the Jacobins all right, in the assembly, the Girondists, work with the sans culottes to overthrow the monarchy. And in December of 1792... Louis XVI was put on trial. He is found guilty, and he will be beheaded in early 1793. He will be taken from out in front of what is today the Louvre, the art museum. And right out front at the end of the Champs-Élysées is a big Egyptian obelisk, the Place de la Concorde. In the far distance is the Arc de Triomphe, and there was the guillotine that cut off Louis the 16th head, all right? The king is now dead. Queen Marie Antoinette was beheaded later in October. Now, she thought as a royal, she would be given the same treatment. There were better guillotines, bigger, heavier, heavier ones with a sharper blade would sever your head right off. But there wasn't just one guillotine in Paris. There were several of them, and the doctor who invented it thought it would be a quick and painless way to, uh, you know, have capital punishment on a criminal. Well, Marie was taken, and the, you know, the people don't like her. They stripped off her royal dress, so she was just wearing like a basic nightgown. And then they drove her in the streets in like a little cage, like a mobile jail cell. People yelled at her, people screamed at her, people spit at her, people threw rotten food and garbage at her. And then she was beheaded by a tiny little guillotine about this big. You can still see it. It's in a place called the Concierge in um, Paris to this very day. And that is all about the story I told you about the let them eat cake, something that she never did say. But her mother did. She just took the blame for it. And with Louis and Marie executed, the new government loses their minds and they declare war on pretty much all of Europe. England, the Netherlands, and Spain. France is already fighting Austria and not doing so well. Well, why only fight one powerful empire when we can fight everybody? Good on you, France. Well done. So they're fighting all of Europe. While that happens externally, the French fight an internal civil war shortly after that. It'd be like the United States fighting the Civil War and World War I at the same time. The only good thing about it is somebody in France is going to win. All right, this causes further unrest and destabilizes the situation at home. And so after that, we get what is known as the Reign of Terror, where over 40,000 French citizens are going to be executed between the fall of 1793 and the summer of 1794. Um, and in April of 1793, the government of France will establish two committees. Number one is the Committee of General Security. They protected France from external threats. So the Committee of General Security is like the CIA. Their job is to probe and keep the United States safe
from external threats out in the world. They also form the Committee of Public Safety. And the, pit, pup, the Committee of Public Safety is threats internally. It's like what the FBI does. FBI does internal threat. CIA does external threat. And to carry out the executive running, the function of the government, these committees are told, you handle external threats, we'll handle internal threats, and as a result, they have almost unlimited power as their job was to secure and protect the revolution. Make sure the revolutionaries can do their jobs. Keep them safe from enemies at home and abroad. And enemies abroad are everybody. England, Spain, the Netherlands, Holy Roman Empire, you name it. And this new government does something interesting. They pass a fully democratic constitution on June 24th, 1793, a new fully democrat, democratic excuse me, constitution is passed. It's pretty much the same as all the others, but it's fully democratic. And as soon as they do that, everyone has the right to freedom of speech, universal male suffrage, freedom of the press. Oh, wait, we're going to declare martial law and withdraw those privileges. We are going to suspend those privileges provided by the Constitution because there is a national crisis. All right? So you have them, but uh, you can't use them because we're fighting external wars and an internal civil war. So we don't have those freedoms in the midst of a conflict. Those are some of the things we talked about earlier when we were talking about um, you know, Japanese um, uh, internment to um, President Lincoln um, and the Emancipation um, Proclamation. At wartime, you can do stuff that you normally can't do. You can debate about it later, whether it's right or wrong, um, but you can get away with stuff you can't um, any other time. Ask Mr. Webb, I'm sure he's got more examples um, uh, for right now. Since we are fighting all of Europe, there is a military draft forcing all males into the army. We're fighting everybody, so guys, we need soldiers. And historically, as I just gave those few examples, it is much easier to get rid of democratic practices during a crisis, during a war. If you take great American conflicts, we'll talk about... Um, you know, President Lincoln revoking um, habeas corpus. He'll do that several times during the war. People scream and cry about it. And he says, well, we're at war. Again, you can get away with stuff during conflicts that you can't any other time. And this new government felt that they had established a republic in which the public or civic virtue of the people would thrive instead of corruption. We are going to get people jobs who want to work for the good of all people. They're not going to be greedy. They're not going to be corrupt. They're not going to try and line their own pockets. They are going to work for the good of all of us. And as a result, to lead them to be the shining example, the leading Confucian scholar, they pick a man named Maximilian Robespierre who was at one time known as Maximilian the Incorruptible. And early on, Robespierre, ah, get him up here in a second. Um, here is the guillotine, here is the big, super nice, fancy one for King Louis, and kind of the smaller, um, more, uh, I guess, generic version for like Marie um, Antoinette. And here we have Maximilian Robespierre. Uh, Robespierre did not like the external wars early on. He says, no, we're taking on too much. He felt, though, that everyone should buy into this new government. You, that's the problem with democracy. You have to want it. You have to participate in it. Remember what Pericles said back in ancient Greece. A man that does not participate in government isn't harmless, but instead, they are useless. So come on, guys, you got to really work for this. you got to read. you got to understand the issues. You have to vote. You have to really want to do it. 
And he said that politicians that work for selfish gains, that are only there for themselves, should be eradicated. I will find them. I am in charge of internal security. I will sniff them out, and I will get rid of them. And so around the city, a series of tribunals are set up. Little, you know, three-person judges, and when you are brought before them and accused of corruption or being an anti-revolutionary, um, that tribunal voted and your sentence, if you were found guilty, was immediately carried out. And these tribunals were set up to publicly interrogate people who were said to be, now there's no proof needs to be given, you can just be accused, all right, of being enemies of this new Republican government. Robespierre himself, as the leader of the Committee of Public Safety, sat over as the chief judge of many of these tribunals all by himself. And the problem here is, there was no defined enemy of the state. Well, what do you have to do to be defined as an enemy of the state? Is it your next door neighbor who's mad at you? Is it your brother-in-law who doesn't like you because you beat him in the NCAA bracket? What is an enemy of the state? And do you have to be found guilty? Or is it just because you're a member of the royal family or a wealthy aristocrat, are you automatically guilty? There's no definition. So it's very broad, very open-ended. And these tribunals will start in the city of Paris. Remember, all of this is being driven by the urban city of Paris. They start in Paris in 1793, and they slowly move to other large cities in France. Thousands of people, a little over 40,000, 40,000 people were executed. By mid-1794, Robespierre goes crazy. The incorruptible goes kind of nuts. And he turns what is called the reign of terror, where sometimes the best way to keep yourself safe is to accuse somebody else. Zach did it in first period. Oh my God, if it's not Zach, oh my God, we may even point at dear sweet Emily. In third period, who knows? It could be Luna. It could be Griffin. It could be Anna. Heck, it might even be Viles back there. We don't know, but to keep ourselves safe, we're going to start accusing anybody. And sometimes if you're really quiet, it's because you've got something to hide. And you're the ones that we are going to go after. It's about survival. And so by mid-1794, Robespierre becomes paranoid. Kind of like a Caligula, or an Adolf Hitler, or a Joseph Stalin. He turns his reign of terror even on public political figures that agree with him. Because they were a threat. They were undermining him. Then, he goes and he executes leaders of the San Kolo. These are the people that put him in power. The poorest of the poor who said eradicate the greedy, eradicate the rich and snobby. Go and get him. He executes them. Then he goes after his own assistants. Anybody who could threaten his power, Robespierre has executed. And then in the fall of 1794, he comes back uh, into Paris. And in June, he got a law through the assembly that allowed him to convict suspects without any evidence. If you, I think you're guilty, then you're guilty. But two weeks after that, he walks into the assembly and says, guys, we got a problem. There is a large group of people who are counter-revolutionaries. These people are after my power. They are the politicians. We need to stop these politicians before they get to me. All right? So you need me to um, pass a law allowing me to execute members of our government. We need to stop those right now. People like Robespierre 
Did you hear just what you're saying, sir? Yes. I said, you need to pass a law allowing me to execute members of our government. And they're like, Robespierre, you do know that we're the government. So you are asking us to pass a law allowing you to execute us? Do you understand what you're saying? Yes, I do. We've got to stop them. They're like, dude, Robespierre has gone crazy. Holmes is a little nutsy cuckoo, like we say in uh, you know Transylvania two or three. We got to stop this guy. So Robespierre, in speaking to the very same people he wanted to execute, is arrested. And in July 1794, Robespierre himself falls victim to the guillotine as he and he is guillotined the next day. And it's the death of Robespierre. you got to like that haircut, kind of like he stuck his face out the window and he was driving really fast down on the road. When he was a young boy, he was elected from his school classmates to read a le letter to King Louis XVI. So he starts out as a monarchist, then he buys into the revolution, and then the man goes blood crazy. He just goes nuts. And so, French Revolution, they stand back, and they realize in six to eight months of 1793-1794, this reign of terror led to the death of their own countrymen, 40,000 of them. The goal was to be modeled after the United States Revolution, get rid of the monarchy, and have a democratic republic. And instead, all we do is kill each other. Due to the psychotic horrors inflicted by Robespierre, the Civil War in France stops. And the wars with the rest of Europe are kind of at like a tie. They're at a stalemate. And the French look around and say, oh no, what have we done? Zut de l'eau, what do we do? Where is my flag? Where is the tricolor? Ha ha ha! I do not know. I really don't know where my flag is. I'm kind of getting agitated. It's around here somewhere. What do we not do? Look at this mess. We've got to find a way to fix it. What do we do? Oh my gosh. I do not know. Oh, here it is, tricolor. We will clean up this mess. And so what do the French do when they don't know what to do with their government? Say it with me. They create a new one. All right, so the monarchy is overthrown, and the Estates General is overthrown by the National Constituent Assembly, which then becomes the National Assembly, which then becomes the convention, and we are now on government in the revolution number five. Yes, all right. And it will become known as the Directory. The Directory also creates a constitution, and it's published in 1795, and France will be run by a five-man government known as the Directory. So, I said it right, this is the fifth government, it's being run by five guys. So we've gone from a monarchy to an oligarchy, and let's just figure out who these five you know, guys are, they are all rich dudes. So really, we have accomplished virtually nothing up to this point. The directory will oversee a two-house legislature, because the British have that thing called Parliament, the Americans got Congress over there, and it will be governed by only males who own property. So even if you're a male and you don't own property, you don't get to vote. We've literally changed almost nothing from the aristocracy. And the directory is very definite about cutting ties with the San Clos because you poor people were in charge, you went crazy, and we killed 40,000 of ourselves. So we really just can't have you in here. And then one by one, excuse me, they began to look for peace with France's external enemies. And the directory says, guys, don't worry, we're here to help. We are going to fix this. Don't you worry, we got this. And the directory will run from 1795 to 1799. 
this is kind of like the, uh, how shall we say it, the Articles of the Confederation period for the United States. The directory is very weak. There is a lot of discontent among the starving poor people. There is a lot of discontent among the directory as they were old rich guys who tried to become even older and more rich. As members of the Sun Kolo were still starving, food riots began to break out in the city. And they're like, oh my God, here we go all over again. So the directory calls upon a military general who had become a hero, defeating Austria in some places and driving back the British in others. They hoped to use his name to form a better government. And his name is Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon will come in and he looks around and he tries for a little bit. He says, you guys are so dumb that I really have to take over. I mean, this is just terrible. He has his own ideas about wanting to unite France under the ideas of nationalism. Be proud of France. Tonight, out in Miss Campbell's room, is the famous fundraiser of the cheese tasting. All right, be proud of fromage and jambon and baguettes and crepes and creme brulee. All right, be proud of what French, what France means, and where the people of France are going to be the most important. We don't need a symbolic symbol of a king and a queen or the sun king. You are what is most important. The poor people eat this up. Yes, yes, that. And so from 1799 to 1815, Napoleon will become a major force that scares all of Europe not once, but twice. And he is a young guy from the island of Corsica, and he was 20, he's a 20-year-old lieutenant in the revolution when he takes over. Or during the revolution, excuse me. 1793, he was an artilleryman, all right? He fired cannons. Ask me about it Thursday, and I'll tell you a story about it. Um, he defeats the British. He drives them out of key ports in France, and in 1799, he defeats powerful Austria in an ongoing series of battles and becomes a general. He is named General of the French Army, and he says, guys, what you need to do is elect me as dictator, like ancient Rome. And when they do, he says, oh, the heck with that, I'm going to take over the new constitution as he overthrows the directory and writes another constitution, constitution number six, he is elected consul, like Roman consul of France, forever. An homage back to ancient Rome. And so he was declared the emperor of France. First thing he does is he tries to mend fences with the Roman Catholic Church. Napoleon invites the Pope to come to Notre Dame and to crown him the Emperor of France. And the Pope does, but just as, a, as the Pope is about to place the crown on Napoleon's head, he reaches up, grabs it, and places it on his own head, demonstrating that he was subject to no one. He was in charge of France. And as he rose to power, Napoleon has the French citizenry voting for him. Everything he does, he tells them about it. I'm going to overthrow the directory and write another constitution. Great, Napoleon, go for it. He informs them every single step of the way of what he is about to do, and they fall for it. Now, not to beat him up too bad, he does do some good things. Um, he modernizes France. He builds public schools. He encourages both boys and young girls to go and get an education. He demands French officials not only be ed educated, but trustworthy. 
He promotes edu public education and peace with the Catholic Church. But he is a conqueror. And here he is in Lion's Mound out here in Waterloo. Napoleon will command what he calls the Grand Armée, the Big Army. Right? And during his time, Napoleon will take on the combined powers of Europe. And he defeats many of them. He defeats Spain, puts his brother on the throne. He defeats Portugal. And Napoleon transformed the country of France to a sizable empire that is the greatest in all of French history. The French take a big beating about being defeated and surrendering. Well, man, you didn't want to mess with Napoleon. All right? He terrifies everybody. But his drive to control the continent wasn't enough. Napoleon was a conqueror. And he tries to attack England. But he isn't successful. In 1805, his navy loses the famous Battle of Trafalgar off the coast of Spain to Admiral Nelson. All right, With his one arm and he dies in the battle. But the British Navy defeats the mighty French fleet. This prevents Napoleon from attacking England directly, um, so he tries to blockade English ports. He tries to cut off commerce. And he couldn't slow them down, so he gives up on that and he focuses on Europe. And his biggest mistake is in 1812, he for some unknown reason decides to attack Russia. And he will lead 600,000 soldiers into Russia, but the Russians do what they always do. Here come much difficult opponents. So they began to retreat, and they burned their crops, and they poisoned their wells, and they killed their livestock, and they walked backwards, and backwards, and backwards, until all of a sudden it began to get much cold in Mala Russia. And when the cold and freezing sets in, the Russians counterattack. They're hunted and hounded by the Russian army on a disastrous march all the way back to France. And they were saying the saying was, by the time Napoleon's army got to Russia, it was so big, the head of it was entering Russia and the tail of it was still back in Germany. Now, that's not true, but it gives you an idea of how big his army is. Only 100,000 soldiers lived to make it back from Russia. Now, Napoleon cared about his men, and he builds a place called the Invalides, which is a hospital to this day. If you're standing at, like, the, the Tubador um, metro stop, and you're looking through the Eiffel Tower, that kind of United States Capitol-looking building in the back, that is the hospital where Napoleon is buried, by the way. And he built it for his wounded soldiers. In 1813, as a result of Russia, Napoleon is forced to step down from France, and he is exiled to the island of Elba. King Louis XVII was inserted as the king of France, but as an economic depression again hit France, um, Napoleon is able to escape from exile. And in March of 1815, Napoleon re-enters Paris and their emperor is back. But he's back for only 100 days when all of Europe will fight him on the famous plains of Waterloo out here just outside the city of Brussels, Belgium. Napoleon's headquarters was right over here. And his army marched across these fertile wet fields due to a heavy rainstorm and ran into the British Duke of Wellington. And with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, Napoleon's army takes a beating. There's this handsome soldier up here who's probably American, helped hold them off. And this is described as a Napoleon beatdown, but it's not true. He lost but just barely. The Duke of Wellington, Lord Wellington, said, give me Blucha, all right? Give me the Prussians or give me the knife. If I don't get reinforcements in the next two minutes, 
I better kill myself because I'm going to have no chance. So anyway, kind of, kind of sad little French soldier there. Anyway, Napoleon is done. Um, he will be exiled to the island of um, St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, he will die in 1821. And the French Revolution is just about over without accomplishing pretty much, well, anything. Um, we're going to briefly talk about the Congress of Vienna. I'll mention it a few more times. With France putting a military scare into Europe several times, the royals of Europe and other heads of state are going to meet for a 10-month period from September of 1814 to June of 1815. And they come up with what is known as the Congress of Vienna. And it was a great time to be a royal. It was a 10-month party. Members of court and aristocrats, they ate, they drank, they danced, they hunted. And in the meantime, they did a little bit of work. And their goal was to create a peace on the continent to protect European monarchies. They had witnessed the formation of the United States and the fall of a French king. And the guy behind it, I'll put his name up on the board when I get back, is Austrian Prime Minister um, Clemens von Metternich. And he was determined to revive and keep the European monarchical system in power. So they worked out a peace plan that would affect Europe up and through World War I, creating a balance of power known as the Concert of Europe. And what it said, it was a peacekeeping force that all major European countries would agree to maintain. They would not let any single one of their members get way too much more powerful than the others. And if they witnessed a neighboring monarchy getting into trouble, then they were duty-bound to militarily intervene. They would stop at nothing. And the Congress of Vienna will kind of keep a loose peace in Europe until World War I. France will eventually return back to a monarchy as Louis XVIII is put on the throne, and all other monarchies in the region, Spain, Portugal, and the different Italian states, will receive them as well. So the American Revolution succeeds, and the French Revolution really struggles. That's it, guys. I will see you tomorrow.